believe in a thing like pure national art or pure culture, uh, and in this in this uh, framework also about uh, the restriction of exchange. And this is not only because I am the director of a cultural institution and would be out of my job if that was so, but I also would be condemned to listen to German folk music all the time. Exchange is needed. There has been brought a lot from Europe to Africa during the past centuries until today. Maybe or certainly too much. It is time to bring more to, German, uh, to Europe. And I think books are a very good way to do this. I would like to end my already not so short speech with a little self-praise. As you may know, there are 15 Goethe Institutes in the sub-Saharan part of Africa. During the last two years, we have been working on a project called AfriComics, promoting the ninth art by realizing workshops in 13 countries, always with a German and an African trainer as a team. We created an internet platform for the publishing of the comic art stories produced in the workshops, and last July had an international meeting and workshop here in Ghana with 17 participants from 15 countries. There were people from Ethiopia, Angola, Congo, Senegal, and 11 other countries. It was a great experience for us, and I'm quite sure for them as well. We had two main goals with the project, or we do have it still. We wanted to create an opportunity to meet and create a network, which worked so far. And we wanted an, an anthology of African comics to be published in German for the German public. Because we feel that there is too little knowledge and too little acknowledgement also uh, of African literature and, and art in Germany. We would also like to translate the whole book into English, French, Portuguese, Kiswahili, and Arabic if possible. But the next step is the German edition. We would like to show the many diverse ways to visualize <coughs> the topic of the book, which is decolonization, the humorous and the serious, the fantastic and the magical story. And I very, very much hope to be able to present this book and maybe also an exhibition next year at the seventh edition of Petra. But now, together, enjoy these days dedicated to literature. Thank you very much for listening so long. Thank you very much, Heike Friesel, director of the Goethe Institute. I will attempt to remember the names <laughs> when I invite the next group. Um, now, we've heard from the hosts, and now the chief organizers, the Writers Project of Ghana, would give us um, a welcome and opening address, and we invite Mamli Kabu. A round of applause for her again. Good evening and welcome to the sixth edition of Peja. We are delighted to have you all here. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about the Writers Project of Ghana. Um, it's a group that was formed to create a platform that would be easy for aspiring writers to, um, to join. And um, the Writers Project has run a series of um, different activities over the years. Um, we, we started with book clubs. We also do writing workshops. Every year we have a workshop called the Moisa workshop, which, is, um, which people um, enter competitively. Um, we also do public readings and radio show, weekly radio show on CTFM, which is called WPG on CT, every Sunday from 8.30 to 9.30 p.m. We also have a poetry, a monthly poetry public reading called Poetry at Abansro. Abansro is this balcony you see up here, so that's where it takes place. Uh, we often pair up uh, a, a Ghanaian poet with um, a poet abroad, often virtually. Uh, and, um, and then we have the Ghana Voices reading series where we usually have um, a published author 
who interacts with the public, does readings, and sells their books. Um, we have produced two anthologies so far. The, the Sea Has Drowned the Fish and Resilience. And um, I believe we have copies of those on sale, so please support us by buying our anthologies. We also have poetry anthologies, two poetry, poetry anthologies called um, Look Where You Have Gone to Sit, and um, oh I can't remember the first one. <laughs> uh, but anyway, they're, they're really good, and they're, they're on sale here tonight and will be for the duration of the festival. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's not easy to become a writer. It's something that many people aspire to, but there isn't any uh, very well-defined way to do it. And often um, ones, the people who care about you dissuade you because they want you to be a lawyer or a doctor or something that's much more uh, reliable in terms of bringing income <laughs> um, into your future. And so um, those of us who feel this, this um, relentless urge to write, um, we don't always know how to, how to do it. And um, the Writers Project of Ghana is, is a place that, or it's, it's, a, it's a thing that creates a community of writers. And I think that is one of the most important aspects of becoming a writer, that you find the community. Um, and, and so um, if there are any secret writers among you, um, please come back um, and find us on the internet and, and join the community because that, that really does help. It helps a great deal on the writing journey. Um, so yeah, we encourage you to enjoy the festival, uh, buy books. Um, we have a wonderful lineup of events, which uh, my co-director Martin will tell you more about in a minute. Um, and also to follow the Writers Project of Ghana outside of, of Pidja Festival time. Um, we have, um, we are on represented across all social media platforms. Um, so yeah, um, enjoy the festival and, um, and come back next year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mamli, for that welcome address. Uh, brief statements from our sponsors. Uh, so if the European Union Commission is represented here. <laughs> is this Peter Schmidt van Helder? Thank you. So you dare to pronounce my name and uh, also correctly. Thanks for that. Uh, thank you all for coming. I see a full house. Very good. Very exciting and encouraging. Thanks uh, Goethe for hosting and Peja for organizing. My name is Peter. I'm the deputy for the EU. I won't keep you long because you didn't come to hear official messages from us, but here from literature and creative minds and more interesting people than me. But just very briefly, three things. This morning I read in the newspaper, a Dutch one, so many of you will not have read it. <laughs> and uh, just uh, to see who has kids here. Raise your hand if you have kids. So there was this statistics, amazing statistic I found. If you read to your kid 20 minutes a day, by the end of one year, the kid will have heard two million words. It's incredible, huh? Just 20 minutes. So this evening already, I have two kids myself. I can do it, so that's maybe minus 10,000. But still, very good for to hear new words, extended vocabulary. Second, as a diplomat, of course, the more vocabulary we have, the more we talk, the more dialogue we have, the better it is, you know? It is not necessary to repeat in these times, but all those bombing going on, conflict, war, etc. as long as people actually talk to each other, listen to each other, it makes for a better world, a little bit. And then the third thing, I'm a son of a bookseller, so since very young, I grew up with books. And first of all, of course, they were Dutch, and then extending, learned English. I was 10, and then we had to learn French, very difficult. Then we even had to learn German. And when I was 20, this is a little bit of a personal story, I went to Colombia, and then, of course, I heard about the Colombia and the Latin literature. So you say, 
I asked a difficult question during the Laboni dialogues, and I had to promise not to repeat that question again. But basically, it's about the influence about, you know, we have, of course, influence from Europe to other continents, but also cross continents. So I was asking about, for instance, the influence of Garcia Marquez, who many call magical literature. He has himself always refused that etiquette on the oral culture here and the uh, traditions here. So I think for me personally, that's very interesting to read from here and then compare to Latin America, Asia, et cetera, et cetera. So for that, I want to keep it at that. I hope everybody really enjoys enormously tonight. Yesterday we had a very good Laboni dialogues with our dear friend, Professor Frankie Edwazine from NYU. Then at the EU residence today at Goethe, I understand also this Sunday at the Dutch embassy. So very many kudos to the PAGIA people to organize this and enjoy your evening. We're happy to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and then quickly from Ash uh, Angleboard Ashanti as a representative. If not, uh, we rush to FCA Ghana. A web Okay, Abbe, uh, Isaac Abbe would uh, tell us a little bit about FCA Ghana, and then the festival director will give us some remarks. Thank you, Bernard. Good evening. My name is Abbe Isaac, and I work with the Foundation for Contemporary Art. We are a network of artists, and we work to promote the discourses around contemporary art in Ghana. Um, we do this through curating and hosting exhibitions, workshops, seminars, and talks, like our Art and Thought Conversations, which invites artists, writers, architects, designers, really anyone working in the creative space to share their work with an audience. And this happens in our library space, which is um, 1.4 kilometers away from here, quite close, and it's at the W.E.B. Dubois Center. Um, we are proud to be a part of the Pija Festival, and we are proud to be supporting the festival by lending our space and services. Um, we wish you a lovely evening and that you enjoy the festival. Thank you. Thank you, Abu. the director of the festival, Martin Ebobe, to pass his remarks. Okay, but thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad you didn't murder my name. Uh, <laughs> with a name, a name like mine, I really um, understand what it means when people want to skip mentioning your name because they can't pronounce it. But good evening to everybody, and it's a great, great pleasure to once again be here and to welcome you all to another edition. I would change the buttons. I'll try and keep this uh, in less than 30 uh, seconds because I know really um, I'm not the reason why you are here. Um, we hope that on Saturday and Sunday, in addition to what you enjoy this evening, you will actually be able to interact as much as you can with all the writers who have joined us in this country, in this place, at this time for Pija. There are many, many very, very interesting people, and we do hope that by interacting with them, somehow all our lives are improved. And so um, with this, I would say the programs are out there. We are running almost at four programs every hour um, from tomorrow, so there's a lot. Do enjoy yourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin Eglebe, for that brief um, take on the festival. Now, with Peja, we don't only think that uh, the literary world exists only in books. We believe that uh, what generally runs uh, the literary world is storytelling. And so this evening, we are honored to have 
a great Ghanaian storyteller who has been at the forefront of film, specifically, but also generally art and creativity, to have a discussion with us. And to have that discussion is also another storyteller. And they are here to share conversation amongst themselves and also with us. So I would read quickly the bio of Aseye Tamaklo. Aseye Tamaklo is a filmmaker and lecturer at the National Film and Television Institute in Accra. She's co-programmer for the Film Africa Television Institute in Accra. She's, all, she's a co-programmer of the Film Africa London biggest celebration of African and African diaspora cinema presented by the Royal African Society. She was the festival manager and director for the European Film Festival, Ghana. Ase Tamaklo is the founder and festival director of Indiva Women's Film Festival, a festival that aims to create artistic platforms for the presentation and preservation of work by, for, and about women. As a freelance editor, her works include award-winning films and television pro uh, productions such as Perfect Picture, Different Shades of Blue by Shelley Frimpong Manso, Who is Afraid of Ngugi by, by Mancha Jawara, Free, uh, Free Town by Garrett Barty, and Chronicles of Odukrom, the Headmaster by Ernest Kofi Abekwe. She recently directed and edited the critically acclaimed documenta uh, documenta uh, documentary film when women speak. Ladies and gentlemen, Asei Tamaklo. And Asei will be in conversation with Cor Penter Ansan. He is a film director, screenwriter, producer, and playwright regarded in many circles as Ghana's most influential filmmaker. He has been a storyteller throughout adult life by way of his works in advertising, plays, films, and design. Very few people know that he designed some of Ghana's popular wax prints, such as Aban Kaba, and you too can fly. Uh, there's a, a rather bootleg version of the Aban Kaba here right now. And uh, I think we, are, we have a photo version that will be seen, uh, of the original that will be seen. Born in 1941 to a photographer, dramatist, and musician father, and entrepreneur mother, and says breakthrough as film director came in 1980 with Love Brood in the Africa. Until that film came along, it was only the film industry corporation, GFIC, that made feature films in Ghana, and they were all founded, uh, funded by the government. Nobody had any track record of having produced a feature which with privately raised funds. And Sam has said on several occasions that it took about eight months to complete the script and eight years to source funding for the film. The success of Love Brood, in Af uh, Brood on both the local and international film circuits strengthened his belief that calculated risks were worth taking. Another worthy lesson Love Brood taught was the need for Africa's creative le legion to constantly draw on local culture and experience. He is always proud to draw on Ghanaian aesthetic milieu to construct narratives that resonate with people everywhere. As an acclaimed filmmaker, Ansan's other works include Heritage Africa, Crossroads of People, Crossroads of Trade, The Good Old Days, Suffering to Lose, The Love of AA, and Papa Lassisi Bicycle. A staunch African, sorry, through a staunch Pan-Africanist, no, sorry, though a staunch Pan-Africanist, Ansan believes that Africans telling stories to the world must not develop emotional attachment to what they consider as their relevant values, and just proclaim them without regard to requisite artistic merits. He sees relevant training as important for success. And that's why, despite the early surge of artistic talent in his life, he strived to study theater, 
design, music, and filmmaking at institutions such as the London Poly uh, Polytechnic in the United Kingdom and the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York. He has won a grant. He has also won a grant enable, which enabled him understudy film uh, production at the famous RKO Studios in Hollywood. Respect and admiration for his general body of work has come from the several awards in Ghana, Burkina Faso, United Kingdom, India, and other places. He has served on the board of several organizations and has been a film training consultant to UNESCO. Ansa is also the founder of Bisa Abrewa Museum in Secondi in the Western region, which further underscores his beliefs that Africans must communicate their values and beliefs at all all times. Ladies and gentlemen, call Ansa. And welcome to the Jet 2022. Good evening, and welcome to Pedia 2022. I hope you all will be able to attend most of the events and um, enjoy yourselves. I have been a fan of Pedia since its, its inception. It has never disappointed me. Um, thank you again for this evening. And Ms. Ansa, thank you so much for coming. Um, so today we are in conversation about storytelling. Um, storytelling comes in different forms. Conversation, novels, film, commercials, music videos, etc. And today I'm going to go through a couple of those because Ms. Ansa is a man hats and um, but all of them into storytelling in different forms and so before we start our conversation we will play one of the very early commercials that most of us are familiar with um, and also that we are playing this because one Mr. Ansa actually scored for for the for the commercial so please if it's ready can we hit the button sound please So if you know the beer, ABC beer, you know, um, I think Club Beer's competitor, this commercial was for ABC, and I'm sure if you are of a certain age, there are people you identify with easily. We'll just wait for the sound, because we really want... It's about 30 years ago, so this commercial is almost 30, uh, about 30 years old. Okay, whilst we wait to get our sound ready, we'll start our conversation. Storytelling, they say, um, works in two ways. The, there's a responsibility of the storyteller to tell the stories and, and give us information and construct knowledge. And then there are those who have to live to survive to, to, to get the story and, and, and pass it on. And so, under that premise, Mr. Hassan, I'd, I'd first like to ask, you are a composer, you are a, a production designer, you are a film director, 
you are a man of many things in the arts. Can you tell us why you decided to go through all of this? I did not decide to go through all of this. It's the gene. My father, a photographer, was a musician. Um, I don't know whether you've ever heard of Axim Trio. That's the first, you know, uh, concert, concert party that emerged in Ghana featuring uh, our noblemen like E.K. Datsun, uh, to Tommy uh, Johnson, and so forth. My father was in the back screen. He would write some of the scenarios, paint the backdrop, compose the music, and so you see where I'm coming from. Um, fortunately for me, I was born in an era where values were treasured in this country. Uh, over the years, when I was a child, I must say, when I was a child, we had the community grandmother, who was everybody's grandmother, who would gather us under the uh, very big tree when the moon was very bright and tell us stories uh, about our heroes and heroines. And uh, as we grew up, uh, we learned so much in the community. And you know, uh, for me to remind you, storytelling is part of the creative art. And unfortunately, I don't see the grandmother anymore. She has become a witch and has been consigned to the camp. And uh, education is keeping us apart from our basic values. Values because uh, grandmother was very interested in ensuring that my grandchild is speaking the language. The language that our ancestors left us with. And that language is so deep, consisting poetry, proverbs, you name it. Nowadays, you tell, you ask a young man, oh my God. <laughs> You see, this, this is what is taking our values away. <laughs> um, technology. Can we put up that light so we can see? Hey, 
applause for the videos we just saw. <laughs> per the videos from the lullaby to the, the commercial, I'm sure you're beginning to understand the kind of person Mr. Ansa is and how he drifts between um, different audiovisual art forms and, and storytelling processes. But Mr. Ansa, looking at the lullabies, the commercial and then tying it with what you were saying about the grandmother, I'm going to push into connecting it to your very famous film, Love Brood in the African, uh, Love Brood in the African Ports. Um, and to ask that, Love Brood is a film that has uh, many reflections, class, status, tradition, modernity, and to think that we are sort of having this conversation again today, why did you decide to tell the story the way you did at the time? Well, uh, there has always been a conflict between who we are and what we've uh, learned in the classroom. Uh, do not forget that uh, we have been or had been colonial subjects. And we were subject to certain values that did not help us appreciate our own values. Therefore, our parents uh, had to, or had imbibed a certain behaviors that never made them come close home. And therefore, when a child tries to go against the parent, for instance, in terms of love. Every parent that was educated was yearning for a child to marry a lawyer or a doctor. Uh, and this was a very popular st story, subject. And therefore, you could see a lot of our women who were forced to marry because of societal status. And I felt, um, and I experienced that in my own house. Time was when my sister, one of my sisters, and by the way, my sister too, the creativity in the family, my sister happens to be the first woman photographer in Ghana, and uh, my father was always uh, looking forward to the daughters going out there to marry prominent people, and I thought I should work against this, <laughs> because it had not worked in many houses. It's like selling your daughter into uh, affluent, whom does it make that daughter happy? Is that what she wanted? My personal experience was having a sister who uh, married an ordinary person. My sister, my father was not too happy about it because uh, it did not help his status. So, and my sister 
was very much in love with this person. Eventually, the marriage broke down. And my sister was very, very unhappy. One day, a driver comes into her life someone very dedicated who was in love. My sister was also in love with this driver. And uh, what happens? They have another baby. And uh, this driver was so happy that he's got the daughter of Mr. Ansar to marry. Of course, by that time, my father had learned his lesson, so he had uh, calmed down a bit about, you know, prominent people. As soon as my sister had the baby, the husband, the driver, lost his job. And, I mean, we had come of age and we were very proud of our sister, so we wanted to help this man to have the outdoor. And the man said, No, I want to do it myself because for the first time I can also be called a man. <laughs> Eventually, my sister was so frustrated and uh, she had a brain fight. And she was taken to the hospital, uh, treated for a while, she came home. One day, I was going to visit my sister when I heard a voice. What have I done? What have I done, my God, to go through all this? He had a relapse and hit the baby on the floor. And the baby died. I went there, and I think I was so encouraged that something had to be done for people to know that love is not always money. Love should be natural and should be treated as such. So that is how Love what came, came about. Um, <laughs> wow. Um, Love Wood is a very moving film. Every time I, I, I watch it and taught it in class, you know, my, my students at the end, you, the way it ends, always ask, so what's going to happen? You know, and, and there's, there's a sample, some scene, the dream sequence also is a, very haunting but the fact that you decide to use stories that you're familiar with your own family stories almost like autobiographies uh, how does do you so i'm tying i'm going to tie this also with the the trilogy the love of aa papa lassis's bicycle and um, suffering to lose but in the love of aa there's a, a, a senior sister in that film called Sister Isaba. Mm -hmm. And we, we got to, we, I, I got to know later on that Sister Isaba is actually your own sister. How do your family members feel knowing that you're making films about them? <laughs> <laughs> they react naturally. They are happy that I have not forgotten them. Casting them in my film without their presence. And they congratulate me for it. All they think about is how does the story impact society? And when society react positively, they share the glory. So are not, they, they are not worried about me using their names. And of course, uh, the Ghanaian, and we have to promote it. Whilst we're having the conversation, can we please cue um, Love Road if it's there? Um, as new generation um, storytellers, filmmakers, writers, 
etc. There, are, most of us also want to tell some of these stories because most of the time we are telling stories that are our own realities we are familiar with. We live in certain societies and we know the realities of those societies, even if we are not trying to directly reflect them. There are bits and pieces that come through. How have you managed, because there's, there's an art to it, you know, art to telling stories of your, of your own, of yourself, than, you know, creating an absolute fictional world. Um, for, for new writers, um, if we decide to want to venture, is, is there anything you'd want to tell us to look out for, especially? Yes, you know, this should not be a problem. And to me, telling relevant stories uh, is not difficult if the person knows his history, where he's coming from, his surrounding, he observes things and memorizes them. Uh, there are stories all around us. But what I realize today is that, for instance, the lullabies we saw, our storytelling started from there. Our mothers will sing at the lullabies, and when I was filming them, interestingly, at the end of every, every shot, the baby, the baby was asleep. So there must be something natural, a spiritual communication between the mother and that child. Why don't we continue it from there? Oh, here we are. You have mothers and fathers today who are so proud to find their children speaking English and not being able to communicate in the mother tongue. And when you go to the village and your grandmother, the proud grandmother runs to meet the grandchild. Oh, ma, ba, hey, oh, mommy, I'm sorry, my child does not speak tree. This is the problem. There is a disconnect between us, our values, what we really are. I have never looked down on the village because the village is a custodian of who we are. We have to learn from there. You know, uh, I had an experience with my great place called Nafti. <laughs> I was appointed an adjunct, adjunct lecturer at Nafti to take level 300 and 400. I said, no, I will add 100 and 200, because that is where talent can be found. That is where talent can be found. I started with level 100, and tell me an unanswered story or a basic story with your siblings, family. Nobody could tell me the story. Perhaps maybe if I had asked Tom and Jerry, they would have told me. No unanswered story. I mean, daily sibling, the pranks we play, you know, among ourselves and to our parents. Tell me something, and the whole purpose for my wanting to hear uh, an indigenous story was to go to the blackboard and to discuss how we can adapt that story into a screenplay. Level 200, I had the same experience. Level 300, I had the same experience. So I invited the dean of said this, you sit down. Are these people the ones to tell our story? Because I, or, or I saw them uh, already in black shirt and white tie, dressing like uh, Hollywood 
you know, directors. And uh, of course, you have seen many of our films that does not have the originality in Ghana or Africa. But what I'm about to say is it's a provocation. A provocation <laughs> that um, could we also say that in as much as there's a certain disconnect and probably with my generation younger and um, a lot more younger, that we could also fault our parents and our grandparents like you, that because who is raising who and who is not feeding the other what is supposed to be, because um, like um, Peter just said, if you, it's the, the, there's the research saying that if you read 20 minutes to your child, your child will get about 20, uh, 20 a thousand words in, I'm sorry, I'm misquoting, but I'm sure we all know what I'm trying to say, 2,000 words. Now, if our fathers, who probably are your sons, or our fathers, who also are you, decided not to also allow us to experience what they experience, then we surely would have lost that because we weren't raising ourselves. I mean, that's why I say it's a provocation. It's not, it's not a provocation. It's happening. It's happening. Now, for instance, me, yeah. I decided that I will never, I will never put aside my values. Even though I might not be able to speak the language my grandmother or father speaks in the village, I understand my language. But the generation coming on has become a fashion, and parents are not worried about what is happening. We go to schools, they have their own language, the broken language fire, broken language fire. But the mother tongue, the mother, because this is what strengthens our growth. It makes and it's been uh, uh, researched and proven that a child who speaks the mother tongue tends out to be more clever than the child who speaks a foreign language. You've already, the disconnect is there already. Because when a proverb is being given, the initiated children are mostly spoken to you to, uh, through proverbs. Proverbs. And these are the initiated ones. And they will not give you that proverb in English or French. So uh, I do not, it's not provocation. I'm talking to the parents who have neglected what should make the children true <laughs> children of that land, but foreigners. If, I mean, I mean, 90% of today's children cannot speak their mother. And it's, it, it's, 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 you know, decreasing by the day. <laughs> by the day. So, who are we? Um, we will ask the policymakers who are your generation, sort of, <laughs> to really look at our curricula as well. I think all of us are guilty in different forms, you know. Um, but of course, I, I mean, how do you write a story of a people whose um, culture, language, values you don't understand? Because yes. really, there's a lot that comes with language. Yes. And that will allow you to be able to express yourself, yes. write well, and probably uh, build your characters better. Of course, if you do not know a basic Kwekwanansi story, you know, what business do you have pretending to want to adapt a quick story for a screen or something? So, absolutely. 
I, I do understand. Can, can we please watch um, um, either um, Heritage Africa or Love Brood so we can connect another conversation, please? Very soon we'll be coming to our audience. So we, we just want us to, if you've never experienced any of Mr. Ansar's work, some of these clips are supposed to be an entry point so that after here you could go looking for like this sound. Thank you, old boy. Well, thanks, Oakley. Thank you, chap. Thank you very much for coming. For he is a jolly good fellow. For he is a jolly good fellow. For he is a jolly good fellow. Thank you for coming. 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 Thank you for coming.
All right, so that's um, Heritage Africa by Mr. Kowansa. Mr. Kowansa, my question is going to be a bit long, but this is Heritage Africa. And you know, you said that even though you're a staunch Pan-Africanist, um, you believe that Africans telling stories to the world must not develop emotional attachments to what they consider as their relevant values and just proclaim them without regard to requisite artistic merits. This film is a film with many themes and it's so layered. History, politics, um, culture, colonialism, um, identity politics, all of it is there. But the way this film was woven, the strands with which this story is wo uh, was woven, and the end, and even the dialogue, especially Kwesia Sumefisma, the, the, the lines you, you wrote for her, for me, I see it in... in, in the I feel the forces in paradise. Your values but yet you understand that to put it across to an audience, you need a certain artistic merit. So please, just take us on a bit of a journey of how you made Heritage Africa. Uh, what's my name? My full name is Kwao. Uh -huh. Pencil. Pencil answer. When I was going to school, the name Pencil was so badly spelled <laughs> to make the English speaker feel at ease in pronouncing it and thereby killing the meaning of that name. Pencil is Peninsu. 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 How do we translate that? Peninsu, head of wisdom. Is that a translation or transliteration? It's translation. <laughs> okay. Yes, head of wisdom or head, the head of family. You know, the head of family. And like Bosomfield, his first name was Kwesi, born on Sunday. The middle name was Atta. He was a twin. Okay. And Busmefi means an illustrious ancestor has emerged again. So he finds the name primitive. He had been promoted uh, to become a district commissioner. And of course, the name had to go, you know, with that status. So Quincy becomes Quincy, losing the uh, meaning. Atta, a twin, becomes Arthur. And then Busmefi becomes Bosomfield. <laughs> Here we are. Who am I? Quincy Arthur Bosomfield. Quincy Arthur Busmefi. What's in the name? Yes, what's in the name? <laughs> <laughs> what's in the name? So, uh, these are some of the values I am talking about. That if you take Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, wherever, there is no name without a meaning. You know? So, uh, how can I not have a, an European parent be called Johnson? Because maybe my name is Wonsun. So you find a closer name to Wonsun that, and make it Johnson. It is, it is, 
You know, some of us have been so subdued. I'll tell you a simple story that someone told me, you know, and uh, make you feel how I bring it home. I hear a Ghanaian, a good friend of mine told, a Ghanaian and Nigerian were in <laughs> Europe, Britain, and they were coming back home. The Ghanaian had overstayed for six weeks. So he gets to the uh, immigration officer and he says, lady, you have overstayed by six weeks. And uh, the uh, Nigerian had overstayed for six months. And she told a simple story. But having been observant about my people and the characters we present, I would put it this way. There was a queue of the Niger Ghanaian and Nigerian. When the Ghanaian went, having stayed, overstayed for six weeks, the customs of the, Madam, you've overstayed for six weeks. Oh, sir, I'm sorry. My sister was... My sister's daughter was not well, and uh, uh, I had to stay to help her take care of the uh, daughter. I'm sorry, it will not happen again. It will not happen again, sir. Well, this will be your last warning. Go away. Then it comes to the Nigerian, and he said, Gentlemen, you've overstayed by six months. Gentlemen, you have overstayed by six months. I'm talking to you. So he turns back and look at the next man. Yeah. What did he say? <laughs> what did he say? He said, I've overstayed by what, six months. When you came to Nigeria and stayed for 150 years, did you take a visa? <laughs> Stand the chair and let me come out from here. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm? You think if I love your year, year country, I'll be going home. Slam the tin or God. <laughs> and here is the same person who will go when he's, he will come back. He will come back. <laughs> but when he goes to the embassy to get, you see, that's why I said, if you are in a situation, nothing must pass you by. Yeah. We are all related. We are all related apart from the way we express ourselves, diversity is beautiful. You know, Ghanaian will like to be godly. Ga <laughs> <laughs> Nigerian will <laughs> stand his ground <laughs> and get it right. Yeah. The man was so frightened that he stamped the thing. <laughs> he stamped the thing and uh, I'm, I'm commoting from your year, year country. <laughs> and, and he will come back. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's Storytelling 360. Being observant and being aware of our, our immediate environment. But, you know, you are also a production designer or a set designer, we call it. And we can, especially for the medium with which you operate, audio, audiovisual, whether it's a commercial, whether it's a, um, a short video, whether it's a, a feature length film there's always a certain understanding of space and how this tr translates into the storytelling process and even the stories you want to tell. I know that when you made this film, the one showing on screen, um, there was a way in which you wanted the house to look, yes. but houses didn't exist like that yes. anymore. But there yes. are some samples of such houses in Adabraka, and you rebuilt, you recreated one at the Trade Fair Center, at the time it was yes. an accessible place, and actually shot some parts of the film there. there. Sometimes we take these details for granted, for granted. you know, but for you, I know that you're very particular about this, this, this kinds of details, but how, what will happen if we decide that in the story, storytelling process, we ignore some of this and, and cut corners. That is why 
you know, the industry now is not growing. Um, we are following a certain trend which to me does not help us. You have very talented, you know, uh, artists from the Kuma Wood. But when they are telling a story, they do not know that you get the outline and you sit down and plan to add some meat to the story. How does it begin? How do you get into the middle? And how does it end? As soon as you see that we know how it's going to end. Is it exciting? That's what we are getting because people or may I say Ghanaians are in a hurry to make money. And they forget that if you spend time to build a story, the film is everlasting. True. And I'm very particular about these things. I would not rush into any story because someone uh, you see, maybe we are lucky. We started when uh, celluloid, you know, very expensive medium. And before you get a little loan to start a film, for instance, I, I was lucky to have my father-in-law. Can you imagine an Ashanti? <laughs> who, who thinks about his nephews? To give me his house as collateral. No, I fainted about three times. Because I did not want to, I mean, uh, lose this house. I did not want to lose my wife. You know, and, and my crew were so angry because of my unending hours that they went on strike. <laughs> Eventually, <laughs> when we finished Love Brew, uh, you know, uh, I had learned so much about working hard and uh, the results being you know, everlasting. So this is what I see. Now we still have artists, artists putting white here to show beard. Oh, oh, you haven't seen it. Um, my, my, my silence is in agreement. Yes. You know, can't we, you know, for instance, Buckner, who played uh, Bosom Field? He was a much younger man. Much younger, but he was working with me in my office. And one day, Selma Alasan said she was standing in for Bosom Field. One day, Selma Alasan. And I traveled to Britain to go and find someone, an actor who could play it. So my last one said, sir, I know you've been traveling, spending so much money. But uh, it's bosom filled. Then it occurred to me, even though he was only about 30 something, I needed 45 year old man, there was something called makeup. makeup. So I made the effort, and it paid off. You know, we are not making the effort. People, I mean, and, and, and uh, video. Please hold that one. <laughs> um, I know that your generation had a problem with video. But also, I, I mean, largely because of content. Um, for the format, we couldn't help it because the IMF had released all the poverty reduction conventions on us, and we couldn't probably not afford celluloid like before. And then there were then there was video, and then there were issues with with contents. But even in video, there were some people who who made an effort to tell really good stories, oh, yes. including you yourself. Yes. Because doing video, you made Harvest at 17. Yes. And, and, and let me tell you, 
doing the only difference between celluloid and uh, video is that one is instant. Yes. The other, but the story telling a story, there isn't a, a, any difference because it's a, it's a medium. One is very, uh, I mean, difficult and expensive. Yeah. The other is cheaper. But that doesn't mean you must cheapen the story. Do you get it? No, sorry, it's not you. It's me. Do you get it? Yes. That does not mean a storytelling has nothing to do with the medium. Exactly. Yes, it has nothing to do with the medium. I will spend the same eight months if I want to tell my story through video and the same eight month through celluloid. I don't think the difference must come from the instance so nature of video and uh, the prolonged age of celluloid. A story is a story. When the grandmother was telling a story, there was no video, there was no steroid. He didn't care about that. He told the stories, built the suspenses, and whatnot. At the end of the day, it's how the story impacts, you know. The listener, the audience, the viewer. As we're about to round up, um, so to round up, at least we can take two questions from the audience, and then we'll round up by playing The Love of AA, which was made in an advanced video era, where it's, it wasn't made on VHS, but I think it was uh, red. Oh, was an obita come? Yes. Oh, okay, a still advanced version of video. So if there are any questions from the audience for us, would like to take it so we can quickly wrap up, yes. First come, first serve, though. No, he's the person who says. Elizabeth, you can start your video now. See whether it comes. Okay, so my name is Eric Mutako. Um, I, I would like us to uh, look at technology. Um, smartphones, now people are watching movies on smartphones. Uh, there, there are discussions on radio every now and then about creating the, the ATA situation, getting the um, uh, night life back, night life in Accra back. I, I saw just a bit of the 80s. Uh, I, I lived, we lived around the Piccadilly Cinema, around Toro's area. And, uh, when, whenever they were screening Love Breed in African Port, my dad, a very strict military officer, will permit my sisters to go and watch only Love Breed in African Port and then um, those other movies. But uh, we, we're trying to get the nightlife back, and crime is very high. Crime is very high. So some of us are leading the charge on social media. Um, why don't us look at this uh, free NCHS situation? The, the, almost every secondary school around has a hall or, or, or two. And then uh, uh, we, we, we're going for high-tech, a crowd mall, where people are compact, people are together, and then briefing on each other. Meanwhile, diseases like uh, COVID and then uh, Ebola, this, the diseases, the pandemics that are coming are COVID um, contact situations. Uh, when we look at um, people are seated in the garden, sort of, everybody is relaxed, there's space around, and then uh, we, we're not briefing on each, on, on each other. And we have a screen, and then they're, they're, they're screening the movie. So why, look at the secondary school situation. We can have, for instance, Aquinas Gardens, a, a garden situation, people sit, relaxed, and then they are screening the movie. As against the uh, Akramo situation, the compact, situa compact situation, people are together, people are beefing on each other. So, so, so we, we're trying to get the night, the night life back, the night life uh, back, sort of. So looking at secondary school situation, I, I would like to suggest that let's, let's look at the, 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 that kind of case where people sit in a relaxed 
yes, we were in the various secondary schools yeah. and we were scripting the movies and then yes. Thank you. Then we, we have space enough to, to and then the price the price will come down as against the very high uh, prices that we have at a crime or situation. So in the relaxed atmosphere, the, the various secondary schools, people in the relaxed environment. Thank you very the, uh, much. We we get it. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, <laughs> Okay, so we're, we're running our organizations. Um, we're okay, um, good evening. Yes, my name is Stan. Um, when I was a child, most of the African movies I watched had pastors coming into the African society and winning triumphant over the traditional priest. Now, I'm a film student and I want to focus on African culture. And one thing I've realized is that Afric as Africans, one thing we do is one thing we do is we like the artistic aspect of our culture and leave the spirituality aspect out. So my question is that as a filmmaker who's how do I portray African spirituality that the people or Africans themselves accept it without any backlash? Well, uh, uh, well, you can. No, you start. Okay, you know, nobody can stop you from uh, dealing with our culture and the spirit because they are the same thing. It depends on how you couch it. You know, nobody, nobody can stop you or encourage you to do that. It should come from you. It should come from you. It depends on what you try, what story you're trying to tell. Now, most of the stories you see, the African traditional uh, preachers are so demonized that when they are even doing the right thing, and of course in half the films they tell, they are not doing the right thing. They are always creating the Jude to kill people, and then from nowhere the pastor comes with the Bible, bah, 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 and uh, everybody falls down. <laughs> and that is why the cinema houses we had during my time that I could base my budget on have all ten, been turned into churches, you know. So I think this is one responsibility the government must take on because the film, the film tool is a powerful tool. And it, I, I think if there's one tool that has been used in our dehumanization process, it's the individual media. Exactly. Yes. And, and to top up, um, and can I say something yeah. about the secondary school space? <laughs> okay. I do not see why the secondary schools, thinking that relevant films can come to their courtyards or to their to their halls, if. Achimota, Laboni, or wherever says, look, we, have sh we want to show a film, Mr. Ansa. We've scheduled your film, so can we have it played? Why can I say no? You pay a little fee, but why can I say no? You know, they're not doing it. They're not doing it because the teachers themselves do not consider the African film. They don't want to encourage the African filmmaking, you know. So, left to me, I would change the curriculum right from the uh, basic, early basic early childhood because or basic we are still teaching pussycat, pussycat, where have you been? I've been to London to see the Queen. We're taking our last question. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah.
service of the nation. No time, peace and rest. Wherever we put you friend. Hello. Yes. Uh, my name is Yao from Kongwache. And uh, <laughs> and uh, I want to remind Mr. Ansar about an experience when he was shooting harvest at 17. At that time, his original intention was to shoot it in English and in Akai. But the good actors that could speak English couldn't speak the Akan that well. So at the end of the shoot, he realized that it was going to sound comic when the situation was supposed to be serious. So at this point in time, my question is, how do we, how do we link up that problem? Where you have very good actors that can express themselves in one language, but can't do so well because we have so many languages to contend with in this country. Thank you. Uh, in French, it was a, yeah, well, it was part of a workshop that developed Harvest at 17. So he knows more than me. <laughs> um, quickly, Harvest at 17 was a story developed in a workshop that Mr. Star was running. And the, sto the original story was narrated by Mr. Mensah, la the yes. late Mr. Mensah of... of um, Adabraka Drama Group. I think it was showcasing GAMP, probably, if you are of a certain time. Um, I'm sorry we're rounding up. What the, the jingle you just heard was also scored by Mr. Ansar for Goyle. So Goyle, Goyle, Goyle for Superpower, I hope I'm not <laughs> slaughtering the jingle, was also made by Mr. Ansar. Thank you all so very much for Goyle being attentive and being such a great audience. So, so friendly to the Mr. is available for those who are able to ask questions directly. We can have a one-on-one -on -one because we need to go to him. Apologies. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here.